Happily, the business headlines are no longer filled with new discoveries of corporate fraud. They've been replaced by stories of courtroom intrigue as the scandals begin coursing their way through our legal system. Who should be made to pay and how much? How should the money that's recovered be divvied up? And what does the whole process have to do with justice? I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is our topic today on USA Inc. Joining us today is Max Berger, one of the nation's leading class action lawyers and a founding partner of Bernstein, Litowitz, Berger, and Grossman. Max, thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure, Sarah. We've come through a period of many, many instances of corporate wrongdoing, and you are in the business of trying to mete out some justice or to help that process along. Um, how, is it, how can we make sure that the people who do these bad things pay? Well, it's it's important that they pay. It's important that uh, that corporate wrongdoing be punished, and and uh, and the payment is on multiple fronts. Of course, the government's getting much more involved uh, in uh, criminal prosecutions by the Justice Department, in civil prosecutions by the SEC, uh, imposing fines on uh, corporations, and of course. Um, uh, what I do is prosecute securities fraud class action cases and individual cases on behalf of, of investors who are defrauded, and uh, that's uh, clearly a very potent way of holding wrongdoers accountable for uh, corporate fraud. You worked extensively, I know, on the WorldCom case and yes. represented, uh, who were the people that you were most closely involved with representing? In that well, we instance? represented, specifically represented uh, the controller of the state of New York, Alan Hevesy, and uh, uh, the New York, uh, the New York State Common Retirement Fund, uh, which is the retirement system uh, for uh, you know New York State uh, employees and retirees. And the other people in the class were individuals or other institutions. They were all investors in WorldCom to, during a particular period of time from uh, 1999 through some time in 2002. Now, in the WorldCom instance, uh, do you feel that all of the various parties that were responsible were held accountable? Y yes, <laughs> I do, uh, with some qualification, of course, because WorldCom filed in bankruptcy. WorldCom was the the the, the issuer of the of the the wrongful statements, if you will, uh, the financial statements uh, and other statements to the public. So. Under ordinary circumstances, the corporate wrongdoer would be a defendant in the case and would pay the lion's share of any any payment in the case. But WorldCom filed in bankruptcy, and uh, and so we had to look elsewhere for a recovery in the case. And so principally, we were looking at the gatekeepers, what we were affectionately referred to as the gatekeepers, the underwriters, auditors, directors, um, officers. Uh, all of whom are responsible to the shareholders of public companies um, that they are employed by. And so um, uh, the focus of attention uh, was what were on those defendants. And, and certainly, uh, while they, uh, I, I think almost, I think all of them paid more than, than would be typically expected from, from them. For example, underwriters in the case paid approximately six billion dollars uh, to, to, to settle the WorldCom case, whereas their fees over the course of the several years that they were employed by WorldCom probably amounted to no, approximately a hundred million dollars. So they paid a lot more than they received in the case, but you know the claim there was was that they are they were gatekeepers, they were responsible to the corporation and the corporation shareholders to make uh, sure that um, that the uh, that the offerings of securities by this particular company were legitimate. And uh, our claim was, was that uh, they didn't do that. They didn't do the due diligence required in the case. So um, the directors uh, uh, paid out of their pockets personally in the case. We recovered 20% of the director's net collective net worth in addition to insurance proceeds. Uh, that's an awful lot for a director to pay. Uh, and uh, it was quite controversial. Many uh, 
uh, uh, corporate law firms uh, immediately wrote to their uh, clients, uh, corporations, uh, directors of public companies uh, who were skittish about our settlement and, uh, uh, and advised them of what to do. And, and interestingly, most of the advice were things that directors should be doing all the time uh, in their functions uh, uh, in being the representatives of the shareholders um, uh, uh, and holding the officers of public companies accountable. So you, you were able to get money from, how about the auditors? Yeah, well, the auditor, uh, WorldCom's auditor in this case was Arthur Anderson, so there was an additional complication uh, there. Uh, we, we actually went to trial against Arthur Anderson. We tried the case for almost five weeks. We were two days away from closing arguments before, uh, before we reached a settlement, and the settlement was based primarily on Arthur Anderson's ability to pay. We actually recovered $65 million from them, uh, which I suppose by, by most accounts would be considered a lot of money from a... Uh, an accounting firm that's no longer in business uh, as an accounting firm, uh, and there were other benefits uh, that we secured for the for the shareholders there. Uh, but um, but I think it's safe to say that if uh, Arthur Anderson were still in business to, as a, an auditing firm and still had revenues, that we would have uh, sought substantially more than that. But I think the settlement itself is considered to be an outstanding settlement. Do you feel overall that the system works, um, that the people who uh, committed the wrongdoing in general, not even just exclusively with this WorldCom situation, but more broadly, that uh, the, the penalties are being paid by the right people, or do you feel that there's some issues with the way the law is structured? Well, I think that today there's, um, in 1995, Congress passed the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, which uh, amongst its many provisions uh, intended to put the uh, put the securities class action cases in the hands of larger institutional investors who had a real stake in the litigation. So I think certainly today, you know, and Controller Hevesy is a perfect example of someone who takes their job as a plaintiff in securities litigation quite seriously. Uh, I think today, uh, where institutional investors are plaintiffs in these cases, they're much more concerned about holding wrongdoers accountable. So we will find, I think, going forward that directors will be held more accountable, auditing firms, uh, underwriters, and of course the companies that issue the statements. But is it a pure system? No, uh, it's, it's, it's not because, for example, directors are insured and insurance companies, you know, uh, uh, companies don't want to settle a case unless directors are released and, and so often it's the insurance money that's used to pay those settlements. Uh, and so, and in the case uh, of management too, executives have insurance. Management have insur uh, uh, has ins uh, insurance, and so they are covered as well. I didn't mean to limit it to directors. Uh, in the WorldCom case, of course, the, the the managers are going to jail. Right. So uh, no insurance so, against yeah, that. So 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 clearly, and and they've been you know we they've been stripped of their personal assets. We actually recovered uh, uh, as part of our settlement with with them. Uh, and with what is now MCI, uh, the former WorldCom, uh, virtually all of the assets of the wrongdoers in the case, and they're going to go to jail, so they paid. But, you know, it's not always the case that the, the actual individuals who perpetrate the wrongs uh, are held accountable, but we're, we're trying very hard to make sure that that happens now. What about shareholders? I mean, if you own stock in a company and you, you've had uh, the financial statements were fraudulent, um, the stock suffers. So you, you suffer once because your investment is, is a fraction of what it once was. But then if the penalties are um, against the corporation and the corporation has to dip into its remaining pockets and pay out, um, is that fair to shareholders? I mean, how do you distinguish between the current shareholders and the shareholders that, that made out like bandits beforehand? How does that get sorted out? Well, it's a it's a very good question, and I think there are there are situations where I suppose you could perceive an inequity. But the truth of the matter is, is that what we what we do is we represent shareholders who, uh, you know, the, the the securities fraud cases are on behalf of of uh, investors who purchase or sell. But let's focus on purchasers purchases of stock within a particular period of time. Uh, that's called the class period. And anybody who's within that class period who suffered a loss or suffered damages is entitled to a recovery. Uh, some of those class members may continue to own the stock after the, the, the wrongdoing, after the class period is over. It's a, it's a choice that they make. But, 
But let's say a fraud is disclosed on a particular day, a stock falls from 20 to 10. Uh, we represent a class of people who purchased before then and we sue, and some of the people who we represent can choose to continue to own the stock. Well, they're, they're, they're making that choice knowing that a lawsuit is pending against the company to recover for investors who purchased before. Mm -hmm. So they're making that decision or should be making that decision consciously uh, because they're aware of the pendency or should be aware of the pendency of that lawsuit. And they may say, well, listen, this is a one-time thing. Management has changed. The company's on the upswing. The stock declined, but it's really worth a lot more. And they're making that, making that choice. But the most important thing that we focus on is getting a recovery for the wronged class, for the investors mm -hmm. who were defrauded. We can't be as concerned about, for example, the employees who might lose their jobs or the investors who may suffer you know, going forward. It's not that we have no concern for that. We want the defendants who we sue generally to stay in business. Uh, you know, We don't want to bankrupt them. It doesn't do anybody any good to do that. But on the other hand, we want to try to recover as much as we can for our defrauded investors. Um, the issue of um, the, the way that the timing of this occurs is very interesting to me. Sometimes uh, it seems like you go after people, and if they agree to settle with you first, they pay the least amount. And then those who delay pay a little bit more, and it's used as a, as a weapon, if you will. Is that fair that the people who pay the most are the ones that are perhaps slowest to come to the table, but may not be the, the most egregious offenders? Well, I think the, the yes, I, 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 I do. I, I don't approach it that way. The way we, we look at our cases, and I think WorldCom is a perfect example of it, where the investment banks who held out to the end, till the end paid significantly more on a pro rata basis mm -hmm. than Citigroup, for example, mm -hmm. who settled earlier. Uh, the, uh, the, the case changes. Very often the case changes. So in, our, in the WorldCom case, for example, our view was, was that the case got better. And so you can't, um, you know, if I, if I offer, uh, off, offer my house for sale to you at $100,000 and you turn me down and two years later it's worth $200,000 and you come back to me and say, well, listen, I'll pay you the $100,000 you offered to sell me the house for two years ago, I'll say, no, the value is now <laughs> 200000 Well, that's what happened in, in the WorldCom case. The other thing is, is that even if the case doesn't get better, you're a lot more secure when you have uh, you know, settlement proceeds in for your investors, and you could afford to take greater risks, or at least the you, you, you know you you know the you, the the plaintiff can in the mm -hmm. case. So uh, it's another factor. Okay, we'll be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high quality full time and part time degree programs at the undergraduate masters and PhD levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Max Berger, founding partner of Bernstein, Litowitz, Berger, and Grossman. We were talking about the, the WorldCom suit and securities uh, fraud suits, but let's broaden out a little bit to talk about class action because it seems to me it's almost becoming a, a dirty word in some quarters, or dirty words, plural. I'm just wondering mm. why, why is that the case, that, that class action lawyers are becoming so controversial? Well, I suppose you're referring to the Republicans who really are trying to put class action lawyers out of business. and. And why is uh, that? I mean, and it, the Chamber of Commerce, as well uh, as most business or bi many. Yes, you're not popular groups. in the business world, and I'm just trying to understand why that is. Well, I think we're very popular amongst investors now. Certainly, uh -huh. you know, uh, institutional investors who are seeing substantial recoveries. But I, um, I, class actions are designed to level the playing field uh, between large, well-heeled, well-financed corporate defendants and uh, small shareholders, consumers, um, uh, employees who were wronged uh, in violation of the civil rights laws. And so, um, and so anytime there's a leveling of the playing field uh, like that, uh, I think those in power uh, tend to wince uh, and uh, want to change things. I suppose there is also uh, some amount of abuse because class actions give 
a significant amount of power to um, those who otherwise wouldn't have it. So, for example, if a shareholder sues on behalf of a shareholder with, let's say, a $10,000 loss, sues on behalf of all investors, that $10,000 loss all of a sudden becomes a billion dollar claim. Uh, an employee suing for discrimination uh, for receipt of overtime benefits or race discrimination or whatever, um, uh, all of a sudden doesn't have an individual claim but represents hundreds if not thousands of employees in the same position. And so that, uh, that lawsuit now has a lot of power. And so uh, with power often comes, uh, not often, but sometimes comes abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, but I believe that the benefits of class actions far outweigh any abuse because we have checks and balances in place in our judicial system and our procedural laws uh, that govern lawsuits that, uh, that can certainly uh, provide a remedy for abuse. If you file a frivolous lawsuit, you, know, you, know, you can be sanctioned by the court easily. Uh, and uh, defendants move to dismiss cases, and cases are often dismissed at the early stages before there's a lot of money spent. So, you know, our view is is that uh, the uh, the the benefit far out exceeds uh, the um, uh, the potential abuse that may exist. I think some of the other concerns about abuse are are about the tactics, whether there's sort of almost a, a shakedown. Uh, attitude that goes in that people go in and they just they want to get money out of people and they force them to the table and force them to to cough up money and it, it feels to some people I think that it's it's gone too far that maybe the tactics have just become a, too aggressive and and then there's those fees the, the lawyers fees can be very large uh, yeah I, I mean I, I well we're talking about two different subjects now I think so far as the 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 tactics are concerned is, you know, litigation is litigation. You're an advocate, you represent a client, mm -hmm. as long as you operate ethically, uh, uh, you know, within the context of that representation, uh, you know, all's fair and love and war. And mm -hmm. so that's just just basically it. And you you use the advantages or the powers that you have in, in, in litigation. Um, as I say, of course, uh, you know, providing that you act ethically. Uh, and uh, and so there is, as I say, a considerable amount of power, but I do believe that if I were named as a defendant in a lawsuit and I didn't think I did anything wrong, I wouldn't be writing a check so fast. I would fight pretty hard uh, to protect my good name if I didn't think I did something wrong, if I didn't think there was any litigation exposure. And I've been prosecuting class action cases since I graduated law school in 1971 and uh, I don't feel there's any case that I've handled since that time, and I've handled hundreds, uh, which was uh, which was was frivolous or not well grounded, uh, and uh, I haven't won them all, but but certainly I n n never believed that I shake was shaking down anyone. Yeah, I certainly uh, wasn't meaning to imply. That no, no, I no, but I'm just giving you my example. Yeah. I'm not saying yeah. that this doesn't exist, but the only context I have, quite is frankly, is my is my own. Mm -hmm. So far as the fees are concerned. Uh, in a class action case, the, the way the process works is you send out a notice to the class after a settlement. The notice describes what fee you're going to request. It goes to every class member. Any class member has a right to come in and object. Uh, the court then has to award the fee. Uh, in the case of securities cases where we represent institutions, our clients actually uh, insist upon retainer agreements in advance which set forth the maximum fee that you could recover in the case which is generally much lower than the fees that are typically awarded uh, and then the court will after considering all objections after public notice the court will award the fee and then any class member has the right to uh, right to appeal uh, that fee so there are a lot of checks and balances that go into uh, a fee award. It, nothing's done under the table. It's all open and above board, and, and everybody has a right to be heard. So it sounds like a lot of the issues that get brought up in this debate over whether the powers of class action lawyers should be reined in, your, your contention is that there already are, is a system in place to deal with these abuses. No, no question. Uh, in, in every respect, uh, abuse of litigation that's brought as litigation, mm -hmm. Uh, excessive fees, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, you know, courts will, will often lower fees or not grant fees to lawyers who settle cases that the court doesn't believe provide any benefit or any value. You know, there are, a, there are any number of coupon settlements where courts have said, well, listen, I'm not going to give you cash while your class ends up getting uh, coupons that they're not going to use. I guess the, the key caveat that you mentioned is that people behave ethically and that um, I think there is now a, a Department of Justice investigation into one major law firm um, in the class action area, Milberg Weiss, and many people are speculating about what that's all about. But uh, mm -hmm. to what extent do you feel that the issues raised in that case um, might permeate out further into the industry? And can you speak a little bit about what the allegations are? Yeah, I, I, as I understand the allegations uh, n now, uh, having read the indictment, it is that in, in certainly in this, in the case of one particular person, a fellow by the name of Lazar, who was a plaintiff represented by the Milberg Weiss law firm in multiple lawsuits, uh, that um, uh, the, the charge is is that he was. Uh, wrongfully paid for agreeing to serve as a plaintiff, uh, in addition to whatever recovery he might have gotten in that particular litigation. Uh, and um, whether that's true or not, I, I, I'm not, I have no, no knowledge of. I only know what I read in the newspaper. But, but clearly, clearly it's improper and inappropriate to, uh, to pay a plaintiff for serving. A plaintiff is supposed to uh, is, is supposed to represent the class uh, without any selfish interest. It's a plaintiff is supposed to get uh, as a compensation uh, whatever the other class members get on a pro rata basis plus their expenses or compensation for their time or whatever it is that they've spent in the case. But no, but special... certainly nothing, nothing extra, nothing that's not mm -hmm. disclosed to the uh, to the court and approved mm -hmm. by the court. Uh, and you know the the reasons for that are obvious. I mean, if you're going to represent a class, you're supposed to do it uh, without thinking about your own personal self-interest. Uh, similarly, the lawyers uh, who are representing the plaintiff are supposed to be thinking of uh, of the of the class that they represent before they think of you know what they're going to get out of it and you know for themselves. I think there's some speculation that this case is being brought as a way to try to to trim back the power of, of class action lawyers that, that, that somehow the, you know, the Bush administration or, or other members in Congress are eager to see class action lawyers you know, have their sales trimmed a little bit. Is that, do you perceive this as politically motivated? Well, I, I don't think it would be inappropriate to, to uh, well, certainly I agree with the fact that the that the 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 Republican Party and the Bush administration would love to see uh, a, 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 this type of litigation, class action litigation in general, of whatever kind, whether it's consumer or discrimination or securities or whatever kind, curtailed. For that matter, they'd probably love to see it eliminated in their heart of hearts. Uh, and um, uh, and you know, it's not unreasonable to think that you know that this kind of Indictment is politically motivated, but I suppose we'll have to wait and see what the you know what how these allegations turn out uh, in the in the end. But it it wouldn't surprise me if there were some politics involved in it. Do you worry that um, that there really could be a, a day not too far off where we don't have the right to bring class action lawsuits? I mean, is that really a, a realistic thing? I certainly hope not, and I don't think it is realistic because I think in the end, average people need to feel that they can go somewhere to be vindicated, uh, to have their wrong, the wrongs that are done to them remedied. Uh, a, um, uh, uh, an employee who's, employee who's discriminated against on the basis of gender or age or race needs to know that they could team up with others uh, to, 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 to have some clout and bring a lawsuit. Shareholders need to know that they could band together to right a corporate wrong. Um, and for that matter, consumers need to know that they could, you know, if you, if you spent, you know, $50 for a particular product that was bogus, you need to know that you could get together with others and, and have the power to bring a lawsuit. Uh, you know, you just can't do that if you have an individual claim. 
In addition to uh, being a very interesting guest, he's also a Baruch graduate. I feel it's important to mention that. Thank you so much for joining us. We've been You're fortunate to have Max Berger, one of the nation's leading class action lawyers, as our guest today. Thanks for being on Thank the show. Thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York, with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages, is the world's first university. Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. The work of class action lawyers has always been controversial. Corporate America has long seen them as a thorn in its side, forcing it to agree to punitive settlements through the use of hardball tactics and the threat of public humiliation. But for the individual shareholder, consumer, or patient, these same lawyers are often viewed as the only hope for justice in their battle against a much larger, better endowed opposition. Unfortunately, the government's attempt to build a case against Milberg Weiss the nation's best-known class action firm, risks being seen as politically inspired. It's hard not to see it as part of a broader attempt to reverse the corporate reform efforts that came about in the wake of the Enron scandal. As they seek to right the balance everywhere else, plaintiff's lawyers better make sure their own house is in order. Their tactics need to pass the smell test, and the political ramifications of the gargantuan legal fees they garner for themselves should be given serious consideration. The role that class action lawyers play in our society is important. Let's hope that in the political battle that ensues, that point is not forgotten. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.